So I'm going to talk today about practical restoration and what that means to me is helping folks understand a way that they can restore their buildings in fairly, with fairly simple methods. And I've brought a few props along with me um, that I'll kind of talk about throughout this presentation. Some things that we use like these shear rings, um, examples of through tenons. You know, most of the failures in buildings are fairly common and they're repetitive. So we've come up with some repair strategies over the years that work really well for things like failed post to tie beam connections and failed post to sill plate connections and stuff like that. Um, so I, I have 158 slides and I have a lot of content and I'm going to go through it fairly quickly and I will try to make sure we leave time. Uh, for your questions, but if you have any questions while I'm talking, just raise your hand and I'll try to answer your question. I'm going to try to repeat it too so that we can make sure that everybody hears it. So a big part of what I do now is talk to people about how they're going to invest in their structures. And these are usually um, things regardless of the size of the building that take time. And, and we're not a stranger to working on projects with the same client for 10, 15, and 20 years now. And so it becomes a question of prioritization, but it also becomes a question of this initial decision to invest in this building or not. And the structures that we work on range from very small to very large. This is an example of a timber and steel structure in Illinois, 19 something or other, 1903, I think, 150 foot clear span. And then we work on buildings that are very small as well. And we work on structures that are, um, to most appearances, uh, you know, failed or too far gone. And, um, and we turn them into structures that, that look brand new, like the one on the right. So the question becomes in some of these initial consultations I do, you know, is this structure a liability for the owner or the future or is it an asset? And in the several thousand buildings I've worked on and looked at now, historic buildings, there are probably only been a, a handful, less than five, that I can't fix. Um, I mean, clearly, there's, there's situations where it's just completely gone. Um, but more often than not, 99% of the time, I can fix a building. And they might look bad, um, like this, you know, where you've got uh, some failed siding and some failed rafters. But, but more often than not, we can fix them. And, and the other thing that we've noticed, um, and you'll find in talking to me that, that we're not just, con, you know, we haven't sort of confined our, our working relationship to the Midwest. We do a fair bit of work of, in Europe and the Caribbean as well, and we work coast to coast in the United States. And what I find is that, you know, the loss of these structures happens where we've got some factors occurring. And, and one of the most significant factors in the Midwest is just, trying to find a use for buildings. So part of what I'm trying to do often is help people envision how they can use this structure and what parts of it they can use first so that we can start the kind of, you know, the restoration or the repair work there. And initially, you know, these buildings can seem very complicated and they can seem overwhelming and they can seem like everything is going wrong with them. The foundation's failing and the roof's leaking and the siding's falling off, doors don't shut and the windows are falling out and all these things are going on. And it can seem really overwhelming. And the beginning part of this is trying to untangle that and trying to start out with some really basic information. And part of that is developing things like a team, developing a scope of work, starting to develop prioritization. And it, you know, doing a restoration project is not like getting a quote from somebody to come and hang an aluminum garage door in your, at your house. You know, there are multiple scopes of work that can be considered, and there's a scope of work that needs to be developed. And, and in this part of it, we often call this the discovery phase, which takes time. There are no simple answers. Sometimes it takes months or years to start to untangle where to begin on a building unless it's a crisis like the Littleton barn, which is going to fall over if we don't do something about it right now. There are a lot more pieces of information out there right now. We, we, we put in this Indiana's Heritage Barns document. Um, you know, this is a fantastic tool that you guys have developed locally 
that starts to help people understand these things. And language is part of the issue. When you don't understand the language, it's hard to have a conversation. And so books like this or briefs like the National Park Service brief help, help to put us all on a common footing with language so that we can talk about what it is that we're going to do. This is all a preface to even considering any kind of restoration work. These are the conversations that we're having before we even talk about how do we repair a post. So terminology is a, is a, big, um, is a big part of this. Language is a big part of this. How do we talk to people about different parts of the building? How do we talk to um, you know, contractors, engineers, architects, so forth? So in a timber frame building, which is primarily what I work on, although I do work on a lot of plank frame buildings, I work on a lot of laminated trusses, I work on a lot of steel and timber buildings, but where we have always excelled um, is in timber frame work, which is joinery. So the first part of that is, is talking about what what is, what are the components of a timber frame? So here we have a bent. This is a five bent building. Each bent is divided by a bay. So that's the beginnings of language. And that's how we talk about these parts of the structure in this country. So a bent is what's highlighted in this kind of darker color. And a wall, which isn't highlighted here, is on the eave side. So we have bents, we have walls, and we have bays. And this begins the, the conversation. We have rafters, which are probably fairly obvious to folks, although there have been many times where I've had people call and say, my joists in the ceiling are bad, and, and what they're really trying to say is their rafters are bad. Well, it's really hard to have a conversation with me if we can't talk, talk together in the same language about what's wrong with the building. So we have rafters, we have purlin plates, which tend to be these pieces up here at the top. That's these guys running the length of the building. In a round barn, um, you know, we have purlin plates as well, although we tend to call those mid-span plates. In a multi-tiered round barn, you might have lower, middle, and upper mid-span plates, but they're still essentially in the same place as a purlin plate, which is the upper plate in a building which divides the rafters. We have the eave plate, or sometimes called the rafter plate, and that's along the eave line of the building that the rafters set on. We have tie beams. This is a tie beam. This is a tie beam. It's a little confusing in the other barn because it has what are called interrupted bent girts in the place of a tie beam. But a tie beam is generally something that, generally speaking, is an uninterrupted continuous member like this. So we can say, our tie beam's bad. And our tie beam to post connection is bad. We have failed pegs or we have failed relish, which is what's going on in this building. And, and, and we've put stirrup straps on it. So Common, common language, tie beam to post failure is very common in barns, so it's important to understand what that piece is. The higher level one here, which this building doesn't have, is a straining beam. That's this upper level uh, green. This happens to be an 1842 threshing barn uh, in, this, in this image. There's the straining beam. So we have an upper straining beam, we have a tie beam, and in the case of that barn, we might have what are called interrupted bent girts, and they're just lower members. Along the wall here, we have wall girts. And on this end, we have bent girts. Some people might call those nailers. Uh, we have queen posts and king posts. There is no king post in this particular image, but these are queen posts. That barn has queen posts. That's canted queen posts. This is straight queen posts. And if we wanted to get a little bit more specific about it, this would be interrupted queen posts because they don't go full length and they don't follow a load path. And then we have bent girts, as we talked about um, these pieces back here. Braces are the diagonals in the building. We call those knee braces. There are things like struts. So there's a strut from the queen post to the tie beam. We have braces in the corner. We might have up braces. We might have down braces. But in general, we say those are knee braces. That's what we call those. And we have posts. We have intermediate posts, like these two. And we have exterior posts. And we have a sill, sill beam, which runs around the perimeter of the building at the base. There's another one in here that um, you might have called a summer beam. And a summer beam goes from a sill beam to a sill beam. Might carry joists in a perpendicular direction. So I'm going to uh, ran through that terminology really quick. But I wanted to get that out there and let you know how important terminology is in these conversations. Because we can't have conversations together if we're not using the same words for these things about what it is that we're going to do. So common repair scenarios and common areas. 
Um, in a Gambrel building, you might have a lot of failure at the purlin plate to rafter connection, which is up here, because this is where the pitch break is in a Gambrel. Um, in, in many barns, and in a lot of barns, you've got uh, rafter, rafter to rafter plate failures. This is quite common in polygonal barns because in polygonal barns, eight-sided to you know, 20-sided buildings, you've got a, a field of that polygon which often sags in the middle. You cre it creates a, a bit of a river. And if folks insist, and I, I disagree with Tommy completely on his, his opinion of shingles versus steel, I'm a strong advocate of putting steel on buildings. But when you, when you put shingles on a building in a polygonal building, there is a a planar def uh, deflection in that building creates a river, and you often end up with rafter, rafter to rafter plate connections where you've got failure due to water damage. All barns get failure due to water damage at rafter to rafter plate connection. And then the other most common area, of course, is the sill. Sill beams that are sitting on top of stone foundations are prone to termites. Sill beams sitting on top of piers are prone to being close to things like rising damp or closer to the ground and they rot away. So sill to post connection is another common rot area. So we're gonna talk about those and we're gonna talk about post to tie beam connections which we see highlighted here. Um, we can talk about it in this building. There's post to tie beam failure in this, in this building as well. These stirrup straps have been put on. Just in general, a peg is worth about 5,000 pounds. Um, a tapered peg might be worth about 4,500 pounds or 4,000 pounds in tension. What we need to keep this building from blowing over in the wind is about 12,000 pounds of value at that post to tie beam connection. So this building has three pegs. You'd think you might get 10 or 11 or 12,000 pounds, but if you don't have very much relish behind the peg, that's the amount of tenon behind the peg, and in general the rule of thumb is four peg diameters, then you don't get the total value of 5,000 pounds. So it might sound a little overwhelming, but this is the stuff that we're thinking about when we start talking about restoration and repair. How do we put 10 or 12,000 pounds of value at the post to tie beam connection so that when the wind blows, that connection doesn't break? That's what we're talking about in these post to tie beam connections. Post to eave plate is another one. Uplift is a common scenario. High winds separate the queen posts from the tie beams. That's the number one thing to have happen. Why? Because there is almost no relish on post to tie beam connection or queen post to tie beam connections. The difference, the, the place that you see that differently is in, tr in timber trust structures. But I guarantee on this building there is probably two inches of relish on that peg, which means that that queen post to tie beam connection is probably only worth about 1,500 pounds. So it's not going to take a lot of wind to uplift that from that scenario. So the same thing is true at post to eave plate connection. Post to sill plate is most often rot. And that's obvious. Either rising damp from a brick or stone foundation, termite or carpenter, termites or carpenter ants, or just plain rot from being a ground barn. Here we go. Eave plate. Um, eave plate to post. Eave plates can be rotten because the roof has failed, and if you have a building that is probably like this one, because I see it in the purlin plates, but at the rafter plate connection, you can have what's called a skew notch, and that's where the rafter sits down in a pocket inside the rafter, and if you have a roof that goes bad, those pockets fill full of water and the whole rafter plate rots out. Really, really common kind of scenario. Um, so eave plate, rafter to plate, um, these connections tend to be, you know, tend to go bad quickly if there is a bad roof um, because both the purlin plate and the rafter plate are sitting horizontally so water sits on top of them. Or checking um, in the top of the plate might allow the water to go through it. Or if there is a through tenon on the post to the rafter plate connection, water travels down that mortise, travels down the post, and rots the whole post out. So all of this is about, you know, in this initial phase, when we go to look at a building and, and we do an assessment and a consultation, these are the kind of things that I'm looking at. These are the kind of values that I'm taking into consideration and I'm doing all that with somebody's budget in mind and their end use in mind. And also perpetuity, you know, beyond their end use because in, in our business we're not talking about years, we're not even talking about decades, we're talking about centuries of use. These buildings should last us more than centuries. 
So beyond this particular user, how can we help this building stand for another 100, 200, 300, 400 years old, you know, 400 years? I'm working on a building in Greece right now. It was built in 1390. It's the oldest timber frame medieval roof in Europe. Unfortunately, it burned in 2017 and, and they want to replace it. But that's a 600 year roof system. So a five or 600 year roof system for wood, barring bugs and rot, um, is totally doable. And that's the way these barns can be treated. So that requires organization and a plan. And that's a big part of what I do in the, in the initial phases of this discovery is organize and plan and start to build a team. And we try to figure out who it is that we're gonna work with in this team. And it, whether it's a very small job and it's, the team is limited to the family uh, that we're working with, it can also be the community, it can be broader organizations, it can be federal organizations, it can be other professionals like architects and engineers. We do our own engineering now, so we rarely outsource engineering, but, um, but that's the whole spectrum of, what, of who this team might be. And, and I've listed a few of these building professionals, trades, craftspeople, research specialists. So research specialists is something I didn't mention. Um, these folks often maybe do archaeology or anthropology around the buildings that we work on. They might do a deep dive research into the building itself, which helps generate interest in it. And then leadership. So what we've developed is this model where we call it a subject matter expert, and we try to have the restorations that we work on led by someone with extensive field experience in the work that it is that we're doing. And that field experience in, encompasses things like repair technologies, language, um, experience working in the field, experience in restoration, and experience in heavy timber. Not one or two or three jobs, but 10 or 20 or 30 jobs like this. That, at, at about 30 jobs, um, you start to become a subject matter expert in this field, I feel like. It's not much different than in training. When we train a timber frame carpenter, we say that you've finally sort of gotten to where it is you need to be when you've hit your 10,000th mortise. So a mortise is what goes in the, you know, a timber for a tenon to go into. So at 10,000 mortises, you know, at 5,000 hours of work or 6,000 hours of work, we start to talk about people being skilled carpenters and skilled in the timber frame industry. So what we're saying here is that these projects should be led by subject matter experts because we believe that it ends up saving people money in the long run. It ends up producing a situation where we're building and restoring structures that will last for centuries. So global objectives, and, and, and what that means to us is what are the big picture objectives? We're, we're constantly working around what is the big picture? It's not, we're not focused on just how is this post rotten here at this sill plate connection, but how are we thinking about the whole project globally? And, and, and by doing that, we can start to drive towards budgets that work for people because it's not about how much money we can spend, it's really about how well we can do the work. And we really work hard to try to get small or large projects fit in people's budget because there are multiple scopes. And these things that are listed here, these global objectives, help us be able to do that kind of work. So environment and place is important to us. And by that, we mean that um, the work that we're doing should reflect the place in which we're working. So in some cases, it might, it might, it might involve the species of wood we're using. It might involve the type of work that we're going to do. It might involve the type of additions that are being done so that it fits the vernacular. We want the work that we do to work well with the time and place. So the, number, the, the beginning of this repair process is an assessment. I've done four of those this week. I do about 100 a year probably. And that's this initial exploration. That's this initial discovery where we begin to understand what it is that you have to work with. And beginning to help you decide what it is you want out of this. What do you want out of this? Do you want to just keep the rain out of the building? Do we want to keep that corner of the building from settling into the ground? Do we want to keep that floor from collapsing? What are our priorities? So it starts with an assessment. And, and this assessment is fairly basic. It talks about species of wood. It talks about 
type of building. It talks about age, perhaps. We start to talk a little bit about history. And we start to talk about the condition of the building. This happens to be one I did 20 some years ago. And uh, 1842 Threshing Barn, Three Bay, Gambrel. We talk a little bit about goals. What are your goals? What's the context of the building? What's your relationship with it? I try to understand how you're related to the building. Is it something that is, is, is an emotional, is this an emotional decision? Is this a decision that's related to income? And what are the parameters? What, what sort of budgets are we working with? And what sort of repair methodologies are, are we okay with right now? This is all part of this initial phase. I can, I can walk in and design a repair to a building that's $150,000 and I can design a repair for a building is $50,000, and they're going to accomplish probably the same thing. But it's going to depend on what it is you want it to look like, and what our end goal is, and whether it's shoring, which is an interesting term to talk about, stabilization, or restoration. These are the three avenues that we can talk about. Shoring, stabilization, restoration. There's another one that I get into, which is called replication. That's when a whole building blows over or burns down, and we just make another one like the one that was destroyed. So best practice, this is what we're talking about a lot, is best practice. Like materials, similar methodology, adjusting the engineering to adapt to a situation. For example, in a, in a museum situation sometimes, um, you can have post to tie beam failure. You have post to tie beam failure in this building and you've got stirrup straps on it. Well, if you don't wanna see the stirrup straps, you can put this kind of connection in here which is called a timber link. And what this timber link does, you drill this in from the outside of the building, and you slide this middle shaft into the post in the tie beam, and you put these expansive wedge anchors in the tie beam connection and in the post, and now you don't see that stirrup strap. I put a lot of stirrup straps on buildings. There's nothing wrong with them. This is a more expensive way to do it. It's also a way to not see the stirrup strap. There's about eight different ways I can handle that connection and then I can handle that failure. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about best practice. We can also do some things like this. This is a three foot long structural screw. I can drive this in from the outside of the building as well, and I don't have to use stirrup straps. I can put four of these in, that connection right there, and I can get a 15,000 pound connection out of that posted tie beam connection by driving this screw in there. Budget is a big part of this, and those repair methodologies have a lot to do with budget. If we're not taking all the siding off of a building, we might think about something a little differently. If we're moving a building, if we're dismantling a building, you know, all these different approaches change the budget and change the repair technology that we use. So I'm gonna go through a couple of case studies. We're gonna get into some of the different kind of repairs that we do. Wapsie Mill a little bit, which is a six story timber frame mill that has a brick veneer on it. And it's a project that I've been working on uh, for 15 or 16 years, there's a number of those around the Midwest where um, they're phased over time and we do what we can every two or three or four years. I was just there a couple of weeks ago putting some, some timbers in the machine floor down in the basement. Um, we were there, we were there um, 12 or 13 years ago. We put, a, we put a lot more timbers down in the floor system right above the river. But all these things are what we call levels of intervention. And the level of intervention that we go to, if we talk, and I will talk a little bit about the Littleton Barn. Littleton Barn will fall over if we don't do something about it. There's a level of intervention there that we can do, and that is budget driven. So I can change the roof pitch on a round barn, and I can turn what becomes an ellipse or an egg-shaped mid-span purlin plate into something that's round again, but that level of intervention might cost a lot more money than just doing what's called shoring it in place. And so in budgets, levels of intervention come from experience. And they come from experience from working on dozens and hundreds of jobs. And that really is what makes these things a success or not, is determining what level of intervention we're gonna go to. This is a, just kind of an interesting photo. Uh, we replaced some post bottoms here and you can see that in a lot of mills, um, they have this interesting feature where the posts aren't continuous. They've got a cast plate that allows the upper part of the mill to vibrate on the lower part of the mill. So they don't go all the way down the ground as sort of a, 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 
adjustable base. Here we are doing some uh, rafter plate repair on this mill. And we did this as a workshop, um, which is kind of why we wanted to talk about this one, because it's stretched over time. It's, we started this job in 2008. I was just there again a couple of weeks ago. Um, that's how long we've been working on this building. And we've done it through a variety of community workshops as well. It's very, um, it's very community supported and, and only community funded. And they, they do all this work with donations. And, and we've done a lot of this work through community workshops. And we've talked about this a little bit, just even as recently as last night with the Indiana Barn Foundation, potentially doing some workshops like that. And we could do that in Indiana. We could do workshops like this. There are ways to train all of you how to do this work. And, and to train you, not maybe because you're going to do it, so that you're more educated about it, or you can see it in a hands-on way. And that's what this workshop is about. This is about these people in northeastern Iowa coming together and saying, we're going to save this mill, and we're not all going to do the work, but we're all going to come and do the workshop. And we're all going to learn about how this work is done so that we can inform other people about it. And what does that do? All of a sudden, we got a whole bunch of educated people out here who know how to do this stuff. And everything in restoration starts to go up. It doesn't mean you're going to do it for a living, but you're going to know about it. And that's, that's the power of restoration projects like this. That's the power of these kind of small community-based projects. We did a job a long time ago in Angola, Indiana, 2004. I built a giant pavilion called the Selman Memorial Pavilion, a brand new timber pavilion. We did that with 150 people locally. I did another one in Kendallville. Uh, we did a windmill, Robertson Post windmill, 16th century windmill that we built. Those were community projects that are new builds. We've also done a lot of community projects that are old builds, that are restorations that take a couple of days or a day. So here's the Wapsie Mill um, close-up photo. So we're, we're just... We're getting to the part now of this conversation where I start to be comfortable. I felt like we've laid the groundwork to talk a little bit about how do we do the work, how do we do the restoration. You know, I can, I can talk all day long about scarf joints like this. You know, it says scarf joint, and it's a repair joint, and, I, and I've brought it for you to look at. You can come here and look at it. I can talk all day about this, but if I don't take the time to explain to you how to use this and where to use this, then it's not... I'm not really doing my job. So this whole first part, yeah, okay. sure. You, you, can, you can walk around the room with it. Actually, okay. I, I had thought maybe that we could pass these screws around too. So if you want to do that, that would be great. Um, but if I don't talk about how you use it, then you're gonna, we're not going to understand where to put it. So that's a repair scarf joint that we use a lot. I'm going to get into um, a couple examples of that. I'm going to get into some drawings. We do the engineering for this. We stamp this stuff. We do, you know, we do the repair work. We do the shop drawings. Part of our consultations now involve a scan of the building with shop drawings that might um, show someone. It doesn't really matter to me whether or not I do the work. What matters to me is that I teach somebody how to do the work or give them the capacity to do it. That's what this presentation is about. That's what our shop drawings tend to be about. <clears throat> 